Hello. How are you? Good. What's going on, man? Listen, all I'd like to say today is that it's quite important that the tailwheel goes together correctly. Because it could be your life, your airplane, no screw-ups, don't take any shortcuts. You got that? It's Bob Rondo reporting over and out. <laughs> This channel is about working on aircraft and flying those airplanes. So come take a seat and let's go for a flight. Welcome back to another video. We're in the hangar because it is crappy outside. Not very pleasant for flying. So we have something pretty, uh, pretty special today. We're going to talk about our little tailwheel back here. Tailwheel uh, tail draggers are very susceptible to, um, well, abuse, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Uh, it's a small wheel. Um, it sometimes, especially in the Stensons, Stensons actually carry a lot of weight back here. It's roughly uh, about 100 pounds. Um, I know in level flight, it's about 100 pounds uh, on the tailwheel. And statically on the ground, it's probably closer to 150. Um, that's a lot of pressure on that little tiny wheel and all its little components and stuff inside. So we are going to take it apart. Well, not we, I'm gonna take it apart. We're gonna throw it on the bench, gonna disassemble it. We're gonna show you all the components inside and kind of briefly talk about what to look for after you've got it dis disassembled, what to inspect for, for any damages. We'll show you how to properly put it back together again, reinstall it back on the airplane and rig it properly. A weak tail spring could be a culprit for um, everything else could be set up properly, but if you've got a weak tail spring, that could be a culprit. So we're going to go through all that, so stick around. So there's a very uh, good consideration, um, and that's safety. Uh, we need to properly support the aircraft before we take the tailwheel off. And there's two things we need to consider when talking about the 108s. They're pretty much all the same, except some are metalized and some of them have fabric. So. On the fabric airplanes, the contact point's pretty easy to see. There's a spot where the tailwheel spring goes into, and that's your contact point. Be sure to check that out. Look at your service manual to get familiar with all of that stuff. Um, and then I'll go through, I'll show you how I built my stand. And mine is actually kind of set up for both the metal and the fabric airplanes. On the metal ones, the contact point is kind of buried inside. The, the metal. Some airplanes should have a uh, an access point or, or a kind of a panel underneath there. And on my stand, you'll see that I have taken and cut two two by fours with a little space in between it. That space is used for uh, missing these two little tubes right here. And all these do is they support the stringers. Uh, if the airplane had uh, fabric on it. So so you may or may not have to do that with your stand. You can build it the way you want. It could be solid or do it like I did. I, it doesn't really matter. So, um, But most importantly, it needs to be tall enough to bring the tail wheel off the ground and then support the, air, the, the tail without doing any damage. Now, as in regards to actually lifting the aircraft, um, I'll, I've got pictures. I know a guy in the International Stenson Club who built a um, basically a um, a jacking. Um, I don't know what to call it. It's just a jack. But, uh, it's a, like a bucket jack. So it will go in underneath the tailwheel, and it kind of sits. The tailwheel sit inside this little bucket. And then you've got a hand crank, a like little winch, and you can actually lift the aircraft and get it up almost level. So I'm going to get the tail in the air. I'm going to get the stand underneath it, and then we're going to commence to taking off the tail wheel. Okay. So now that the airplane in the back has been supported and the tail wheel is off the ground, uh, we can do just like a general, general inspection. Um, if you have any movement whatsoever in any of this mechanism, the saddle, the spring, or anything, and right there, the first issue. This should not move at all. That should be just completely solid in there.
You also want to inspect inside here for any keyholing like this is and that one right here. Just make sure it's not excessive. Always keep track of your hardware. That's very important. So if your chains don't slip off really nice and easy, what you can do is turn your tail wheel towards the direction that you want to take the chain off. Then what we're going to do is we're going to loosen up and take off this nut and take that bolt off. And this entire tail wheel assembly will just come right off. And that's probably the, the easiest part of this whole deal is getting this thing off. A couple of three quarter inch or three quarters, however you want to say it. Not the washer, in the tub. And it comes off just that easy. So the rest of the tail wheel looks pretty good. We're gonna go and take the tail wheel assembly over to the bench and mount it on a spare spring so we can do the disassembly over there. And next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take off the wheel and then that'll give us access to the pinion nut that's underneath the wheel. Get a grip, man! Get a grip! Oh. And I'll put this aside and we'll clean that bearing. We'll clean that bearing up here in a little bit. How we get these uh, chains off here is there's a little teardrop kind of ring, and it's kind of like a paper clip. So we slide the chain down the paper clip in between the two, and then bloop, it comes right off. Same basic principle, even, except it's a little more, it takes a little more finger strength. Come on, I think I'm gonna there you go, baby. Ha <laughs> ha. And then that comes right off. We're going to go upside in here. We're going to take that cotter pin off, and then that nut is the pinion nut that holds this bottom part to the top part. And this is actually really solid. I mean, the only movement that I had, other than the vise, was I had movement about this pivot point right here when it was on the airplane. So, um,. Now that I actually have it bolted up nice and tight now, I don't think it was a bushing problem. I think it was just the torque on that came loose and made a little uh, shimmy shammy. That's a, uh, that's a technical term, by the way. Shimmy shammy. Oh, you know what? I have the exact tool for this. The exact tool for this. Where is thy nose picker? Thy nose picker. I've used this in a previous video as a pointer. This is a cotter pin removal tool. We affectionately refer to it as a nose picker. The head of your cotter pin, this goes right into that and with a little bit of leverage, try not to scratch anything, get that wiggled up in there. This we'll just pull that cotter pin right the F out. Check that out. It helps to have the right tool for the right job. Is this is three quarters well. It is. Look at that. It's three quarters as well. And it feels just slightly loose. Now you're going to want to support this all the way through while you're loosening this up. Because this thing is spring-loaded. I guarantee it. Right it in. It comes off just like that. And goes in the tub. Carefully, carefully. Look at all those springs. No wonder this scares the crap out of people. 
I wouldn't want to take that thing apart. Lose all them damn parts. There's a little friction plate right up in here. I'm gonna take that out. I'm gonna look at that. Looks pretty good. So I'm gonna take a little time here to uh, go through the rest of this, clean it all up, and then uh, we'll lay everything out and show you where all the different components are and what to be looking for. I spoke a little too soon about leaving y'all for uh, doing all the cleaning of whatnot. Um, wanted to show you um, what all parts you need to take apart and how to get this apart into the individual pieces to clean it. So there's a friction plate that will be up underneath here. We pull that out, clean it. You should have, for a Stenson, you should have all five of your little springs in here. Okay. The plate originally only, some of these only originally came with three springs and those springs were on these posts. But because of the extra weight of the tail wheel on a Stenson, uh, there should be two extra springs that go into these locations that don't have pins. So, friction plate, take your springs out. And then here on the steering horn, what we do is we just grab this, give it a little wiggle, and you should see that piece come off. If it were cheese, it'd be Gouda. So when you take that off, you're going to have this little spring on either side here, and that just sits in that recess. We will prize that out momentarily. As our British friends would say, prize. Prize. That's prize. That's what you get at a carnival or fair. Alright. That top cap comes right off. And then, then the bottom with another bearing plate underneath. There. And then. Everything's so greasy right now. Hard to come apart. Come on. Come on now. I got some fingernails, man. Bingo. Alright. So, if you have something really thin, like a six inch scale, all I did here was uh, come in right next to the horn and we lift that one off. I'll try and keep these in order to where they go. And then there's this little gizmo right there. It's kind of like a little woodruff key. This is your centering pin. That is the major disassembly. This is actually a good time to be talking about the differences between what we have here is a Scott 3200 tail wheel. Um, these are still in production. You can still get parts for them. Um, I think it's Bushwheel Alaska, or there's a company in Alaska that. Uh, Bush Bushman's Bush Bush wheel something um, they still make parts for these still still kind of expensive tail wheel I mean hey keeping keeping your airplane from producing sparks on the runway yeah kind of priceless so um, they're pretty happy about some of their parts so the Scott 3200 was not originally installed on Stenson's However, the mall, which I have a copy of over here, this is the mall tail wheel. It's a little more, well, shall we say, dainty? <laughs> so this is what would have originally come on the Stenson. A lot of these I know were changed uh, because of issues with these being abused, them wearing out, and not being rigged properly. So they get a lot of shimmy out of them. So there was a lot of recommendations to start using the Scott 3200s because they were available and um, probably a little bit more tail wheel than the airplane really needed, but the moles were just kind of a little less than what the airplane needed. So it was always better um, in a lot of people's opinion to go with a beefier tail wheel. So, and especially if you're doing grass landings and off-field stuff like that. People have a little more confidence in landing on uh, grass, so they drop the tail down faster than they would on, on asphalt. So 
Um, when you're on asphalt, you probably probably take your time and maybe might be a little uh, um, a little less reluctant to bring the tail down sooner on on the asphalt. At least I do. Um, but however, my setup prior to making some adjustments to the cables, the springs were too tight. So before bringing the tail down, if I had any rudder in on either side, they would pull that tail wheel over and boom, to rattle, rattle, rattle. And that was what was causing, you go back to the Apex video and you'll see a perfect example of that one. So, um, however, the last time I flew it, um, I had the chains about one length longer and it felt weird because it didn't feel as solid as far as like as soon as I pushed the rudder I would get start getting some turning. This was a little more straight tracking and um, I was less inclined to put inputs in that would cause me to go back and forth. So it tracked a little straighter but it felt looser and upon landing that tail wheel was right down was I mean centered up nice and you could still see the rudder move just a little bit and the tail wheel didn't budge at all. When it comes time to getting at your bearings for the tail wheel there'll be this little washer seal plate whatever and it is pressed in there nice and tight so when coming in here to get this thing out you want to be very careful gently try and get underneath it and pry that thing loose and just be patient with it it will come eventually there we go just that easy and then we can little wheel bearing there will be quite a bit of grease on the inside cavity make sure you get all of that out of there and probably the easiest way to do that is to get your rag push through one side and right on out the other. Ugh. That'll get the majority of it. Um, but you'll have to do a little, uh, little more touch up, clean up, so that you can inspect your races. And you'll have to clean off your, your bearings really good. Make sure you get all of that grease out of there. I mean every bit of it when this thing goes back and forth you'll see if it uh, pushes out any grease and then after it comes out of the uh, <coughs> out of the solvent and you think you've got all of it out of there um, just run it um, by hand do not use air pressure don't use the nozzle if you spin these bearings up, they will go ballistic and they could come apart. So, I cannot stress that enough. I know it's cool to look at it and go, zzz, zzz, that's pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Until you're not wearing any glasses and the thing comes apart and takes out your eye. It's only funny until someone loses an eye. Then it's hilarious! Once you get everything down to these little bits and pieces, I go down to the um, business center at Costco and I get these uh, steamer trays and you can get these in almost full sheet sizes I mean they get pretty big um, but these are really good for uh, um, basically making uh, little parts cleaners um, you put your uh, mineral spirits in here and then uh, we'll clean up all the grease and uh, um, get a good look and make sure that uh, um, we inspect all of our parts for any damage or cracking or wear, wherever it would be. So <laughs> we will now leave you with that. I'm going to go spend some time. I'm going to clean up all these parts, get everything all laid out, and then uh, 
we'll get back into the reassembly of the Scott 3200 for the Stenson 108s. Okay. So every six months, I get a tool from my dentist. I don't like these toothbrushes, but, and it goes right in the garage or comes to the hangar because that's really good for cleaning up your uh, little bits and pieces. The nylon brush is good because it doesn't scratch anything and it can get into all the little crevices. So. So what I like to do with my bearings is uh, I get them wet first with solvent and I get the majority of that stuff off out of the little crevices. You can see where the, the rollers go. Just want to get some of that grease out of there, get it loosened up, and then it goes back into the tank where it can sit. But getting it, uh, getting it started with that initial, um, getting it the, the bearing race to kind of spin around a little bit. Um, is very helpful in getting a lot of that grease out of there. So once I've got my disassembly portion of the tailwheel, or any part for that matter, if I've got something that's really greasy, I take my rags, and I've got all the majority of all the junk off, put them aside, put them down on a nice clean surface. That way you're not transposing crap from one part to another. It's kind of a handy way of uh, cleaning out your springs. If you take your spring, scale, just put it in there and then just twist away. And it will start pulling out some of that grease. So in the bottom of the horn, there is yet another bearing. And the easiest way to get that out is to just take a, uh, I think this is a half inch, or I want to find a socket that fits right on that bearing race, but will still go down through the hole. And just give it a couple taps, it should come out pretty easy. Now that we have all of our parts cleaned and we've now ready to inspect them, uh, a couple of key items that uh, we're going to look at here. And uh, first, we're going to take a look at the horn here. And what we're going to key in on are these little uh, springs hanging off the end here. Uh, these springs should not be rounded. These have a little bit of a burr on it, but we'll, uh, we'll take care of that here in a second. But in general, these, the, the flat area here, looking at it from this side, this should be flat up against the scale, this area right through here. And why that's important is that piece sits inside your steering horn right here. And inside the steering horn, you'll see some, uh, some notches. And these notches right here, where the scale is going into, that's where those springs will rest. And that's what holds this steering arm in that locked position right here. So there's the spring, and it's sitting in this little notch right here. So you want to make sure that when this is in here, that any side pressure that I put on that horn is holding it in place. So this thing is staying locked. And then, in general, you're just looking for any blemishes or any damage uh, gouging in the plates or the dust caps or anything else. Um, and then we'll be ready to uh, put everything back together again. We're gonna glove up because we're gonna show you how to get these dinky little bearings and uh, show you how to pack these things. Some of you guys may have uh, wheel packing uh, tools, uh, but generally speaking, these, these bearings are so small that those tools 
are too big to pack these, so you end up having to pack them by hand anyway. And we'll show you how to pack bearings by hand. We're gonna take and load up a little bit of grease, and you're gonna put it right there in the middle of your palm, just like that. And then we're gonna take the outside edge of the bearing, so basically the you got a tapered end and the big end, and we're going to take the big end and we're just going to throw it right into that until we start getting some grease through the top. And then we're just going to turn it a little bit. This is a, a brand new day today and the weather's a little bit better, so we're going to hear some airplanes flying. Just the way it goes. <clears throat> So we're just gonna keep going around and keep changing that angle until we keep getting a little more grease. Once that grease pops through, and this will uh, this will also uh, test your uh, cleaning abilities as well, because if you have any old grease, you're gonna be shoving that old grease out through the top. Probably have a little bit there. Old grease, not bad. But everything else on the inside is going to be brand new. We'll edit out the other two bearings because it's like watching paint dry. <laughs> good timing. That's good timing. I'm actually going to turn the, the tailwheel up upside down. So, because it's going to make it a lot easier to install these parts if we're doing everything on the underside. So if you're not going to replace your pinion, it's really hard to clean this thing. So what I suggest you do is hook up the grease gun, shoot some fresh grease through that pinion, and knock some of that old stuff out of there so it doesn't contaminate your fresh grease going in. All I wanted was one good glove and that gave me a blue dress and a cigar. I'm in a bunch of trouble. We will start with the fork assembly. See that little knobby thing there? That is why the that's where that little notch and the bushing goes. But before we do that, you can see the differences in the heights between these two. So this is the bottom one and this is the top one. And so forward, so I'll always refer to everything as, as it's on the airplane. And there's two little cutouts right there. Those are gonna be on the aft side of the center line and it sits in this little recess right here on the outside. Then we uh, take our lubed up bearing. And we want to make sure that it sits down and goes right where that little notch is at. And then we're going to take the paw, which is this little guy here. I just saved you the boredom of me putting the chains on. So on this paw, you're going to notice one side is just about 50 thousandths longer and it's going to be on this side. So that's going to be facing down in that slot. And you'll know if you've got it backwards because you won't be able to get the scale underneath that. If this were spun around, You're going to see you can get that scale all the way underneath that paw. That's incorrect. So what we want to do is spin it around so it's sitting all, right, all the way on the bottom. And then the legs of the steering arm are going to go in the aft here. And what I'm doing is, is I'm going to set that steering arm so it's on one spring. 
And then I'm going to take the cushion end of my pliers. I'm going to depress And we're going to grease up our plates. All of this stuff can take a, a, a liberal amount of grease, but we'll do a final grease once it's on the airplane. So we take that bearing plate and, or that little bearing, yeah, take that bearing, set that on there. Then we take the top cover plate and making, looking for where the cutouts are and those are going to go over the bottom dust cover this is just going to go right over the top and it's going to go pretty square just like that and that's covering both sides once then we're going to take our or springs and that plate so that you're going to have something that looks like that this top side this surface up here you want a little bit of grease but don't heavily coat it same thing on the inside uh, this is a this is a friction plate and it should have a little bit of grease and I do mean a little bit of grease not a whole lot just enough to kind of coat it. So we'll have something like that. So what we're interested in is that paw that you want to make sure is facing down. That paw is going to go into the back and put that paw right in that little notch on the back of the headstock. Now that we've got the springs, you don't have to mess around with trying to balance all the springs and everything is in there. We're just going to set this right over the top of the pinion. What we're looking for is that paw just to go in and engage right into that little notch. So we're going to take our firing and we're going to put her right there and then we're going to take a brand new brand new grease seal and uh, so after putting that seal in there you might have to seat it um, with a uh, socket that's uh, just fits on the inside edge here because um, that's the new seals are pretty tight um, after you do the seal there's a little spacer all right so there's this there's the oil the grease seal and then the bushing sits right on the middle there and that's pretty tight too you might have to persuade that one a little bit as well uh, we're gonna put a washer the uh, castellated nut and you'll notice you're gonna start off with a gap you're gonna notice that gap is in there because those springs those five springs are pushing against the two friction plates start tightening this up once it starts getting close to where you see that gap going away You want to feel and start feeling that friction as you tightening it up. When it starts to get to that point and it's really tight, you know you've engaged the bearing, the roller bearing. You want this to move nice and smooth, but kind of firm. 
but what you don't want to have is any kind of rocking any side movement maybe one flat so this is all kind of there isn't really a, a specified torque for this it's kind of on feel but you can tell when you've got it right when you've got a combination of not too much drag but it's not too loose and if you want you can play around with changing the flats until you get it to that point so next thing is uh, putting in your cotter pin before you put the nut on there take a look at where the hole is where that position on the pinion, where the cotter pin's gonna go through. That way you're not trying to guess what flat to put it on. That would be nice. That's nice. A little tappy tappy to get your cotter pin seated. And that will also help spread it open so it makes it a little easier to uh, fold over the ends. I'm a little funny about a lot of my hardware just because I'm a funny guy but generally speaking most hardware the head of the fastener will always be on the top or on the front and that's just because if like on a bolt if the nut rolls off the bolt won't fall out because it's held captured in either the front or the top position gravity or just natural airflow or whatever else keeps that faster in place so that's why i put my cotter pin head on the front of the tailwheel it doesn't really matter but like i said i'm just weird <laughs> as if you didn't already know that Alright, cotter pins in place, torque feels good, it's not too loose, it's still nice and very, um, I guess solid is a good word for it, this feels solid, so, which is what we want our tailwheels to feel like when they're, when they're good, so, I will not bore you with the installation of the wheel, um, we'll get all that finished up and then we'll head over to the airplane, we'll get this bad boy bolted back on and before, oh, oh, almost forgot almost forgot this right here is a very essential component to the tailwheel this is the bolt that holds on the tailwheel onto the tailwheel spring if you don't know what the length of your bolt is all you need is a scale or some sort of measuring device I mean you can even use these cheap old plastic calipers it doesn't have to be extravagant you just need to measure in sixteenths of an inch. That's a half inch bolt. This makes it an AN8. So, to get the length, we're gonna measure from the bottom of the bolt to right here where the threads end. And that ends up being a little more than an inch and a half. Probably the most important fastener on the whole tailwheel assembly. Now. I recommend, and I know one of the guys from the International Club, uh, his name is Greg Redding, I believe. I think I got that right. Um, he is like a guru of the tailwheel. I digress. <clears throat> so, recommend you change this bolt on a regular fashion. This is really a very inexpensive bolt. It only cost... Um, it was less than two dollars I mean it cost you more in the shipping to get it but I keep a regular store of these on hand um, just because it's just it's very easy insurance to make sure that uh, your uh, tailwheel stays uh, fixed that is what keeps the tailwheel on the airplane 
preventing the sparkage, <laughs> as it were. Um, this one was a little bit too long, and you can actually see there's some really good marks in there. Those are just going to be stress risers. If, if, if anywhere on this bolt it's going to snap, it's going to snap right at those, some of those spots. So what I ended up getting was one a little bit shorter, um, but the idea there is you don't want to go so short that you're submerging all these threads inside of this spring or inside the head of the tailwheel. So um, this is a AN-21A. It's not drilled like this one is, and it's one length shorter. So we will see how that turns out. Um, but in any event, I won't bore you with uh, putting the tail of the actual wheel back on. Um, we'll just meet back over at the tail of the airplane and uh, we'll show you what to look for when uh, hooking up your springs and uh, getting everything adjusted correctly. So. so we're back here at the tail of the airplane, about ready to put on the tail wheel. And I could first tell you the torque for this thing is uh, pretty mind-blowing. It's uh, 400 and... How much hot you? If you don't have one of these, Standard aircraft handbook. Very handy. There's tons and tons of information in here. For a half inch 20 size bolt, we're going to torque this 480 to 690 inch of pounds. Which, if you go in the middle of that range, 585 ish, and divide that by 12, and you come up with 48 foot pounds. So that's what we'll be torquing our bolt to. Snug. <clears throat> oh. all right. Now, all you need is one click. These torque wrenches are calibrated to a specific torque and they go to one click. So if you sit there and go, you see people all the time go click, 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 guess what? You technically have just over torqued the fastener. So, we don't need to go any higher than that. I've got about three threads showing. That's nice. A lot of these checks are a lot easier to do once it's on the airplane. Because everything's, you can actually get the lock. So I had previously had my springs facing on the inside. I've actually gone and swung these around. So now they're on the outside. So that any kind of movement would have made it a lot easier for these springs to pop off. It, if anything, it'd be easier for that chain to pop off if it was on the inside. How we want to do this setup is we want to push the tail wheel all the way up to its stop. Then we want to push our rudder over to that same direction. And then we're going to take our chain and see what kind of length is going to keep from pulling back in the other direction. Here, I'll, I'll give you an example of what we do not want. I'm going to shorten this up. Okay, this is two links too short. What this is going to do, now I'm full right rudder, right stop. As soon as I let go of the tail wheel, see how it pulls back? That's because there's tension on this cable pulling it in the opposite direction. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay. So if we're full right rudder and full stop, See, the tension on the left spring is making that chain here too slack. So what's happening is if, as in, we're trying to go right rudder and push the tail wheel to the right, but now we're fighting this other spring because this is too tight. So what we want is to where this is just loose enough. Oh, I got 
bolt it too tight. So full rudder deflection, full stop, and that is just barely tight. This side, full right rudder, full steering, that's at the stop, and that is just barely tight. So that's about as far as I can get away with um, as far as links. It's enough that when the tail comes down, there's not extra spring tension forcing it in an opposite direction, basically. I guess that's the best explanation for the having a little bit of slack in both of your uh, chains is you need to have that enough slack in here to where the tail wheel is not fighting against the opposite chain because this is a right turn with the left chain trying to force the wheel back to the left. Um, I'm going to give both of these Zerk fittings a little squirt of grease and then uh, we'll uh, set her on the ground and then we'll talk about some angles um, because there's an angle if you imagine a line from the pinion going straight down and then there's an angle of the fork going forward. If you have a weak tail spring, meaning this spring doesn't have a nice arch to it, and it's kind of flat, what it's going to do is it's going to change the angle relative to these two points, and that's going to have a tendency for that tail wheel to not want to stay centered. So as it sits right now, it's very proud because this is a very new spring, and the shape of that spring is such that it's causing the angle of the forks to sort of move forward. And what that does is the momentum going forward is going to want to trap and keep this tail wheel going and tracking straight. Well, that about wraps it up on this one. Um, I hope that uh, this was good information for you. Um, maybe you learned something. Uh, if you want to add something, put it down in the comments below. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Uh, safe to take off the uh, squinters. <laughs> I hope this was uh, some insightful uh, tidbits on how to take apart, inspect, and put your tailwheel back together again. And if you have a shimmy, um, chances are it's either something to do with your chains or with the, the uh, angle on the tail, on the tail spring. So I just want to give a special congratulations to a young man back in Georgia who just got his private pilot license, not only in a tailwheel, but in a Stenson. He's part of the Ron Alexander Youth Aviation Program. And those folks are doing some fantastic things out there in Georgia, uh, encouraging the youth to get into aviation, which is, of course, our future. So congratulations, young man. You deserve it. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. All right, take care.